The theme for today's service is transform us. The scripture presents Luke's account in the transfiguration of the Lord. In this encounter, Jesus transforms into an image of radiance and light. From our earliest beginnings, the community of Christ has divinely called to witness of God's transforming power. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus invites three of his followers to climb a mountain and to pray with him. During this time, Jesus is transfigured before their very eyes. The appearance of his face is changed and his clothing becomes dazzling and bright. His followers then see Jesus with new eyes. We are reminded in this narrative that we cannot linger forever in our mountaintop experiences. Jesus shows this miracle to his chosen followers to deepen their relationship, discipleship and further prepare them for the service of God's mission. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. As we go throughout our service today, be reminded, what divine encounters have you experienced throughout your journey as a disciple? In what ways have these experiences inspired to invite people to, to excuse me, invite people to Christ and develop disciples to, to serve? How is God calling you to share the peace of Jesus Christ with those waiting to hear the words of the gospel? As we gather for worship, let us consider God's transforming power in our own lives. Let's stand and sing, bring forth the kingdom, number 387. Come to the mountain with Christ our God. Come and seek the love of God. Come and seek the light of God. Come to proclaim God's brilliance. Come to the mountain with Christ our God. You may.
You may be seated. Comforting God, as we pray for peace this morning, we do so in the midst of conflict, turmoil, and uncertainty. Of specific concern is the safety and freedom of the people of Ukraine. In larger perspective, the future of all of Europe, both countries of Eastern Europe who feel direct threat of what may come next and Western Europe who are committed to defending their neighbors. We are challenged to even know what to pray for. Do we pray for safety and peace for Ukrainians who, even now, may be sacrificing their very lives to defend their land? Do we pray for leaders of the nations to show wisdom even when their priorities are conquest and defense? Can our inadequate prayers cause your spirit to change the course of conflict? We are comforted by the promised and demonstrated power of the spirit to change hearts and outcomes. The promise of shalom, the fullness of the peace of Jesus, comforts, uh, comforts our troubled minds and hearts. We feel assured that you hear our prayers better than we find the words to express them. With these promises, we are comforted that our prayers for peace are heard and do make a difference because we pray in the name of Jesus, the peaceful one. Amen. All right, can the youth please come forward? Which could really mean anyone. <laughs> Skylar, are you being paged? <laughs> oh, Susan was, okay. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Finn, come on up, buddy. All righty. So who likes games? We're gonna kind of play a little one here, okay? We have to use our imagination a little bit and we have to, to think about some things. So in today's scripture passage, we are told that after spending some time uh, with God, Moses, his face was glowing. What does that mean? Happy, okay. Anyone else? What would glowing mean? If you saw someone, you said, wow, you're glowing. What do you think? Yeah. 
They were excited, could be. Anything? Yeah. They were emitting a light. They were physically bright. Yeah. Can you imagine, just shut your eyes for a second, okay? If a person was glowing on TV or on a movie that you like to watch, what would that face look like? Think about that, okay? So even if our faces don't glow, after we spend time with God, that time with God can make us feel warm or glowy, right? So we're going to play this game now. We're going to do this. And you, you kind of have to do some actions with your hands, okay? And I'm going to ask you guys some questions. And if you can think of something, you have to do the actions, okay? So I'll talk you through this, okay? In this practice we're going to do now, we're going to try to look for the light of God in our life or in others, okay? So when I say things like to see the light of God, it does not always mean light. That's really confusing, okay? But sometimes it might be the spirit or what's inside, okay? So let's close our eyes and let's think back of either earlier this morning or maybe yesterday, okay? And here we go. Ready? What made you happy? And where did you feel warm and glowy? And once you've thought of something, I want you to place one finger on your eyeball. I got a good one. Okay. Keep it there. What made you grateful? Or where did you smell the light of God? Where did you feel it? Once you've thought of something, gently place another finger on the tip of your nose. Maybe. Okay. What made you calm? Where did you hear the light of God? What brought peace to you? Once you've thought of something, okay, gently place one of your hands over your ear. What made you excited? Where did you taste the light of God? Once you've thought of something, place another finger over your lips. Here's a really important one. What made you feel loved? Where do you feel the light of God? Once you have thought of something, wrap yourself in a hug. Finn, you should give yourself a hug. Grandma loves you so much, I promise, okay? Yeah. Now I want you to think about tomorrow. How can you share God's light with others? to make them feel happy, grateful, calm, excited, loved. Once you've thought of something, I want you to place both of your hands on top of your head. Finally, I want you to look around, okay? Imagine seeing light all around you. Do you feel warm? Once you've imagined God's light around you, place your hands in a cup in front of your body. There we go, Reese, you're doing a great job. Imagine God's light moving into the space created in between your hands. 
How would God make that glow? Move your hands towards your heart and imagine God's light moving from your hands into your heart and living there. And as you fill with light, it's important just to remember that you can share what you have here with everyone. So when we think about Moses glowing, and maybe, I don't know, if Dan may talk about that later. We can glow here, even if we can't see somebody glowing here. That's kind of big and hard to think about. But we'll let you guys go back to your, your seats now, and I hope everyone can glow in their hearts. Good morning, Northwest. Can you hear me? All right. Well, good morning. It is so good to be back with you, even in a virtual space. Uh, I had the pleasure of living in Des Moines for almost eight years, and it's so good to see so many beloved faces and hear your voices again. Um, I'm joining you from Minneapolis where it is colder, but uh, like somebody said earlier, we are also grateful that it is going to be warming up this week. So very grateful for, for those shifts. But I want to admit something to you this morning. I want to admit that the brokenness of the world has weighed pretty heavily on me this week. Russia invading Ukraine and perpetuating a generation of wars the governors of Texas and Florida are targeting queer people with horrifically discriminatory actions. High schools in my community are canceling basketball games with each other because black students are being called horrible things by parents and students at their opponent's gyms. Children in my community are going hungry and sleeping in tents in the middle of winter because we can't decide whose responsibility it is to feed and shelter them. Y'all, I'm tired. <laughs> I don't understand. I want someone to come in and fix it all so I can go back to enjoying my Netflix and my French toast. For those of you who know me, French toast is one of my favorites. <laughs> in the midst of so much evil, of so much dehumanizing behavior, how can the gospel possibly bring good news? I don't know that today's scripture provides answers, but I do think that it does present us with a way forward, a way rooted in the life and vision and priorities of Christ. And it all starts with us putting ourselves in a position to encounter God. As was shared earlier, we're in the gospel according to Luke, and Jesus has just been out teaching and walking with his disciples, and now he's tired as well. And so it says that about eight days, so more than a week after the last sayings, Jesus takes with him Peter and John and James, three of his closest friends, and he went up on the mountain to pray. The scene opens with Jesus taking a few of his disciples up the mountain to pray. This is actually a pretty typical pattern for Jesus. He sets time aside often to draw close to God and to recenter himself. He makes it a part of his regular rhythm. In ancient Palestine, mountains were considered to be holy places. Anyone who's looked out from the top of a mountain at a peaceful river valley down below, or the sun setting out on the horizon, can get a feeling of why this might be. People felt that being up higher brought you closer to the divine somehow. In the Jewish tradition that Jesus stands within, Yahweh or the Lord, God, often appeared to leaders when they went up into the mountains. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and would often retreat to a mountain to be with God. Elijah, he ran to the mountains to escape persecution and to be reminded of his purpose. And Isaiah talks about God's peaceable kingdom as a strong mountain. 
it only seems natural then that Jesus would take his closest circle up a high, translate very close to God, mountain for spiritual refreshment, deliberately reminiscent of Moses, the great founder of the Jewish religion, and Elijah, the great voice of justice. But before we move too quickly into the story, it's important to pay attention to Jesus' intent here. Why was he going up the mountain in the first place? To pray, to pour out his heart to God, and to intentionally put himself in a posture of listening for God's direction. Finding spiritual practices that recenter us in God's desires, that draw us into the divine heartbeat of the universe, is foundational to embodying the hopes of God's peaceable kingdom in our lives, what we call discipleship. And Jesus was really smart. He's a smart guy. He took his friends with him. He knew that community matters, and he knew that his relationship with God would be strengthened as he experienced it with others. It's one of the reasons that we come together like this, even virtually, even across the great distances, to form community and to be with one another as we seek to reflect on our lives, on our actions, and on our expression of faith in the world. You can't be a Christian alone, but you need people to walk the journey with you. And while Jesus is praying, while he's there surrounded by his friends, something begins to happen. A change starts to come over him. It's such a dramatic change that it even affects how the disciples see his clothes. They become dazzling white. No bleach can do that. The appearance of his face changed, Luke says, which is tough to do without a really good plastic surgeon. Something significant is happening in the life of Jesus. We don't get the scoop of what's going on in his heart or in his mind, his inner feelings and understanding and the shift that's going on. But boy, do we see the results. This isn't a subtle shift. Oh, Jesus, did you get a new necklace? It looks really makes your eyes pop. It looks fabulous on you. No, <laughs> this is a radical transformation of his entire being. It's so substantive, so profound, that the early writers called it his transfiguration, a complete change of form as Merriam-Webster would later define. Something profound, yet ultimately unexplainable, happens when we encounter the living God as well. Our lives and our viewpoints and our actions aren't just tweaked, they're transformed. In that moment, Peter and James and John, they see Jesus alongside Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest figures of Jewish tradition. And Jesus is just sitting there talking with them. He's chatting it up. He's living in, he's sharing in the heritage of Moses, who was the vehicle for God's liberation of the Jewish people from their bondage and oppression in Egypt. Jesus is living in, he's sharing in the heritage of Elijah, the mightiest prophet who confronted the evil and corruption of the mighty and the greedy by providing food to the poor and uplift to the forgotten. Jesus shares their mission. He makes it his own. Jesus is here, the message says, to liberate the oppressed and confront the powers that be with a message of good news for the poor and the other today, here and now, starting on that mountaintop. Jesus isn't here just to tweak the systems of the world just a little bit. He's here to utterly transform them. It's really a powerful moment. Peter, ever the one with the good intentions but just barely missing the mark, decides that it would be cool if Elijah and Moses hung around so they could all enjoy being together singing Kumbaya on the top of the mountain. How about we set up some tents, he offers. It's thoughtful, it's practical, but it misses out on what's actually happening. And it presumes 
that the beauty of what's going on up there on the mountain is only for those who are there to witness it. He wants to keep the good news of this liberation locked up safe and tight and within his control on top of a quiet, removed mountain. God bless Peter. We often chuckle at Peter, but I know that I'm often way more like him than I'd care to admit. I love the addition in the text of the very human angle. Right when Elijah and Moses appear, it says, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. Fatigue, it's real, you know? We've been feeling it so profoundly for these last several years. It's almost written into our bodies by now. We're tired. Like Peter, my eyes and my heart get weighed down with weariness. And I want to set up camp exactly where I am and not take another step, please. Haven't I learned enough already? Haven't I shown the adequate amount of compassion? Haven't I been generous enough? Haven't I made enough of those little tweaks to declare myself as I've arrived? Haven't I earned the right to just stay up on the mountain and soak up the good life? Because let's be honest, friends, there's a lot to be tired from. Some days it seems like it would be simpler to just drift off into ignorant, blissful slumber and tune out the complexities and the heartache and the injustice that seems to overwhelm the world. Some days, we think it would be better to just stay up on the mountain, enjoying God's blessings for ourselves and settling for someone else's transformation rather than our own. But the scripture continues and it says, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory. Their eyes are weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory. Stay awake. Stay awake for the new thing that God is doing in our midst right now, today, in this moment, in this community. Stay awake to the transforming impulse of the Spirit. Stay awake and alert because it's too easy to lose sight of Jesus when the fatigue of the world sets in. When we're tired, when we're worn down, it's easy to slip back into old ways of thinking, isn't it? It's easy to revert our expectations back to those of the world where power and division and scarcity and resorting to violence and me first thinking rule. It's easy to nudge out the Christ of liberation and peace and sharing for the common good and welcoming the stranger and replace him with the shallow stand-in of an idol dedicated to nationalism and rigid creeds and the conqueror who always happens to be on our side. In short, it's so easy to let ourselves define Christ around our own biases that reinforce an unjust order. We may be content to let faith tweak us a little bit, but only far enough that it won't actually challenge us and our comfortable patterns of thought and action. But friends, friends, that is not where encounter with the living God leads. It leads to transformation. And as the sacred texts of Community of Christ remind us, the road to transformation is the path of the disciple. When Peter makes his offer to set up a bed and breakfast on the mountaintop, suddenly a cloud descends on the whole scene and a voice from the cloud declares, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. 
And then the clouds lift, they go away. Moses and Elijah, they aren't anywhere to be seen. And we're left with Jesus, who is presumably no longer sparkling white, and the disciples standing there alone. It's almost as if Jesus, in that moment, has fully taken on the role of Moses the liberator and Elijah the justice seeker. It is him we are to listen to. He is the one we are to follow. Jesus Christ, the embodiment, the enfleshment of God's shalom, God's peace, God's justice, God's desire for the world to be equal. This Jesus Christ invites all people to come and receive divine peace in the midst of the difficult questions and struggles of life, not separate from, but right here in the middle of it all. We are to follow Christ in the way that leads to God's peace. And in doing so, we will discover all the blessings of all the dimensions of salvation. And that way, that path of discipleship, leads us down off the mountain and into mission. In the following verses, Jesus has brought the disciples down from the mountain. Spoiler alert, they didn't set up tents to sing Kumbaya for the rest of their lives. And into a nearby village where a desperate father asks Jesus to heal his son. Jesus does, and his mission of transforming the world begins anew. It's a powerful shift in scenery if you stop to think about it, from the dazzling face and the luminous robe with the greatest names in Jewish history to an out-of-the-way country village where regular people are dealing with the struggles and complexities of life. This probably wasn't what Peter expected. It's often not what I expect either. Peter was probably expecting war councils with the great heroes of the past to overthrow the Roman Empire or receiving teaching from them that would affirm that he was doing everything exactly right. He was probably expecting a comfortable faith to let him be detached from the pain and the suffering of his community and didn't ask more of him than a few little tweaks to his behavior and worldview. There are days that that sounds pretty amazing to me. But the Jesus of the transfiguration, the Jesus that Peter is to listen to, this is a Jesus who defies expectations and turns our notions upside down. This Jesus is only truly himself when he enters into the brokenness and suffering of the world and brings care and hope and healing. This is the path of discipleship that we are invited to follow. Moving from encounter with the living God into service of God's living people. It's the road to transformation where our expectations of what is holy and purposeful and right shift in light of God's priorities. The gospel, the good news of God's love story to and with the world won't just tweak us, friends. It promises no such thing. It promises nothing more and nothing less than the complete transformation of our hearts and actions and the very systems of the world. The good news of the gospel, dear friends, is that God extends this same possibility of transformation to each of us, exactly where we are in this moment, beckoning us to walk the path with Christ and shaping a better world together. As I look out upon the anguish caused by greed and hate and perpetuated by violence and lies, I try to remember that God weeps beside me, but that God also offers a pathway through. God is inviting us 
you and I and our neighbors and our enemies and the people screaming racist obscenities at high school basketball games and world leaders with their fingers on nuclear launch buttons. God is inviting all of us to enter a path of transformation based on radical love, extravagant hospitality, unyielding grace, and disarming nonviolence. This isn't a naive hope of a comfortable mountaintop, but a persistent, realized hope of a father in a lonely village who seeks and finds the best for his child when he is willing to believe in the possibility of transformation. When this hope is rooted in community, sustained by spiritual practice, and expressed in justice-centered mission, it can change the world. Not just tweak it to make it a little bit less oppressive and a little bit easier to bear, but transform it. So all people and the very creation itself can know the full liberation of God's shalom, peace, justice, well-being in the here and now. The road to transformation is the path of the disciple. May we walk it in love together. Amen. Hamilton, Missouri is a little town about 30 miles east of Cameron, Missouri. I don't think it's big enough to have a, a, be mentioned on the interstate sign. I think the interstate sign says Cameron and St. Joseph. So 
if you go off of that exit and go east, you come to Hamilton. In Hamilton, Missouri, there's a small art store called Let's Make Art. And each um, week, uh, one of the owners uh, makes a video of uh, how to paint an easy uh, watercolor painting. Easy is their word, not mine. And if you saw the pictures that I paint, it would be very obvious. At the beginning of the demonstration, the leader invites everyone watching to say the oath with her. The oath is, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my art to others. I promise to have fun. I'm telling you this because today's prayer over the disciples' generous response includes the phrase, guide us in our choices as we strive to follow and share with those of less abundance. It raises some interesting questions. We often talk about giving to our true capacity, but we don't define true capacity concretely, which is reasonable. Our, our abundance, our true capacity, and our sharing are all subjective, and we can approach them in a couple of ways. We can compare our own situation with the page in the Sunday paper that highlights a beautiful and very expensive house. Or we can compare our situation with those who Joppa volunteers deliver food to on Sunday afternoons. We get quite different answers with each comparison. This is where the let's make art oath comes in. We make decisions about abundant gifts, true capacity and sharing when we promise to be kind to ourselves and not to compare our abundance with others. I'll say that part again. We make better decisions um, about our abundant gifts, true capacity and sharing when we promise to be kind to ourselves and not to compare our abundance with others. Let's pray together the, the prayer blessing on our offering. Pray with me, please. We impart to you, Lord, of our abundant gifts. Guide us in our choices as we strive to follow you and share with those of less abundance. May our gifts be of comfort to and the poor and needy, the sick and afflicted. We pray, Lord, we will have the sight to see and the wisdom to answer the needs of your people. Amen. In the spirit of transformation, God calls us forward. We've been commissioned to share the light of God's transforming peace. Use the gifts you have been given to further Christ's mission in the world. Go now as witnesses, sharing divine light with all people. Let's stand and sing our hymn of sending forth. Now let our hearts within us burn.
Dear Heavenly Father, we are truly, have truly been blessed and are thankful for the message that we've received this morning. Uh, next week we begin our Lenten journey, and I pray as we prepare for that and as we encounter people this week, that you will direct us and transfigure us to become the disciples that you want us to be, so that through that service we can bless others. In Jesus' name, amen.